let's get into the earliest of life on earth and what what specific fossiliferous a, a new word i learned uh, what specific fossiliferous site contains what have been dated to be the earliest fossilized remains of life yeah um life can leave its calling card in the rock record in several different ways and i think most people would agree that some of the oldest uh little altered rocks that we can look at are about three and a half billion years old there's some of them in south africa there's some of them in australia and those contain several different calling cards for life uh one is if you if you go to a place like the bahamas today you'll find in some areas along the coastline there are just these carpets of microbes mostly a group of photosynthetic bacteria called cyanobacteria and these microbial mats can actually trap and bind sediments and build three-dimensional structures called stromatolites that get preserved in the rock record and in three and a half billion year old rocks from Western Australia in some of the earliest carbonate or limestone like rocks that we know of there are stromatolites and we've done work with some Australian colleagues that make I think a compelling case that these did require microbial communities to to make um, at the same time there are chemical records of life so for example photosynthetic organisms when they take co2 and fix it into sugars um it turns out that carbon as an element comes in three flavors about 99 percent of all the carbon atoms on this planet have six protons and six neutrons so it's called carbon 12 it's molecular weight about one percent has an extra neutron carbon 13 and that's stable and then a couple parts per trillion are carbon 14 which is radioactive and decays on a time scale of thousands of thousands of years so the, the reason i bring that up is that when a plant or a cyanobacterium for that matter takes in co2 it preferentially incorporates carbon dioxide that has the lighter isotope of carbon carbon 12 and by using an, an instrument called a mass spectrometer you can actually calculate the c13 to c12 ratio and in modern environments if you look at say limestones accumulating in the bahamas and organic matter in the same sediments they differ by about 25 parts per thousand and when you go back in time that persists and it persists all the way back into these three and a half billion year old rocks so we think that's strong evidence that there was a biological carbon cycle at the time i could have told a similar story about sulfur that there was a biological sulfur cycle and then finally there's the question of of actual microfossils and, and i've spent many years working on microfossils in sort of earth's middle age the so-called proterozoic eon and and they're abundant they're well preserved uh they're interpretable but what you see in these three and a half billion year old rocks are just very simple spheres and it is challenging to interpret them so there's a lot that we don't understand about life three and a half billion years ago but we think a it was there b there were biological carbon and sulfur cycles and c the ecosystems worked without oxygen okay again a number of things is the idea that these stromatolites in any of these given sites were formed by masses of cyanobacteria or by a different type of organism that just happened to form stromatolites that that's an important point we don't know that these oldest stromatolites were made by cyanobacteria um i think for earth middle age and going up to the present because stromatolites still form in some areas uh cyanobacteria are the major architects but it's possible that some other kind of bacterium in fact something that may no longer exist was important three and a half billion years ago and then you already indicated this but that there is controversy over some of these findings and what i find myself wondering is what are the sorts of alternatives that could make sense of 
the simultaneous presence of stromatolites, the ratio of carbon-13, the the sulfurous evidence, the difficult to interpret uh, potential microfossils that are spherical in nature. What what compelling evidence or what compelling alternatives are there that could account for this? Well, yeah, I, I think that it is not controversial to state that the geologic record records life of three and a half billion years ago. And I think it's from there that it gets more difficult. Some people will say, oh, there must have been cyanobacteria. But I think that's an overinterpretation. Um, we do know that there are physical processes that can produce this variation in carbon isotopes that we see. In fact, the most famous of all origin of life experiments, the first one by uh, Stanley Miller in 1953, uh, that those reactions actually, what's called fractionate carbon isotopes, they actually result in products that are depleted in uh, carbon-13. But if you look at the details, it's very hard to take those kind of physical processes and account for the record as a whole that we see at that at that time. So I, th I think that the broad statement that there was a biological carbon cycle is well supported. Also, when you look at stromatolites, yeah, there are physical processes in which uh, basically the minerals of limestone simply precipitate and can form layers that way. But again, there are details that can differentiate between microbial mats and uh and physical processes and even at three and a half billion years ago we see some of this telltale textural evidence that i think really requires that there was uh biological processes with actual microfossils it, it's more difficult uh we actually wrote a paper some years ago where one of our, our graduate students in the department had been doing work on about 800 million year old rocks from northwestern Canada. And he brought over just to look at well, some, hey, well, uh, some what's called thin sections, paper thin slices of rock glued to a microscope slide. And you look at them under the microscope. And much of what we were looking at was simply the kind of textures that you see in rocks of this age all over the world. But there were little veins through which hydrothermal fluids had. Uh, percolated. And in those veins, there was actually um, some movement, transport of organic material, which then spontaneously condensed into 10 or 20 micron spheres. Looks for all the world like what you see in these three and a half billion year old rocks. And we know from independent evidence that three and a half billion year, years ago, most sediments were shot through with hydrothermal fluids at some point in, in, in their existence. So again, we can argue the details and, and a lot remains unknown about these things. But I think the, the overall statement that life was there and it didn't use oxygen is, I, I think that's pretty compelling. At this well, point. actually, I, I didn't want to cut you off, but I have it on very good authority from a few reliable canonical text that life is in fact only about 6,000 years old. So I, I, I don't think, <laughs> think that we should overlook these highly reliable sources, but uh, we will uh, for the purposes of this conversation. Um, how, uh, I think, I think you, you mentioned this or to be clear, that was a joke, <laughs> but yes, <I> <laughs> okay. Um, That's why I'm still okay. on the line. <laughs> um, well, when I, when I talk to, astrophysicists i find myself often making jokes about aliens and i occasionally get worried that they think that i'm actually i mean it's not that it isn't a topic that shouldn't be discussed and we'll get to astrobiology it's important but it needs to be taken with needs to be treated seriously i suppose is what i wanted to say but you already mentioned a little bit about how these rocks are dated but carbon dating hasn't really come up on the show before and i think it might be interesting to hear about just how we know for instance that 
these sites, the rocks there are 3.5 billion years old. Um, it all has to do with radioactivity. Discovery, what, in 1899 by Becquerel, something like this. Um, and in radioactivity, there are some forms of elements that are radioactive, which means that on various time scales, they spontaneously uh, transform into other elements. They might shoot off an electron or something like this, but they 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 do actually they're actually have finite lifetimes and they transform into something else that can be stable. And it turns out that nearly all isotopes known on Earth are radioactive. The stable ones, the ones that make up the world around us for the most part, are are relatively few. Now, most of these radioactive elements have very short so-called half-lives, uh, and so they don't last very long. But some of them have very long half-lives. And, and the most important one is uranium, where two different radioactive isotopes of uranium break down to form stable lead. And we can measure the rate at which that happens in the uh, in the laboratory. So we now have a natural chronometer. And there's a particular mineral that's beloved by geologists called zircon. Uh, it's what, if you ever have cubic zirconium jewelry, we're talking about zircons. Uh, zircons are, are these incredibly hard minerals. They form by the same processes that make granite, for example. And uh, what's interesting about them is that the crystal lattice of a zircon as it forms can incorporate uranium, but it cannot incorporate lead. So any lead that you find in an ancient zircon had to get there by the radioactive breakdown of, of uranium. And because of that, we can date zircons rather precisely. Um, and what, what, one of the things that's interesting about that is I, I said earlier, there are no rocks that are older than 4 billion years on Earth, but there are some zircons that appear as sand grains and younger sandstones that go back to 4.4 billion years. So it, it is, again, just to uh, recapitulate, it is the process of radioactivity. It is the ability to measure the rate at which different uh, isotopes break down into stable daughter products. And it is then the geologic fieldwork that allows us to go out and date rocks. So for example, if you look at that, at the uh, rocks behind me, um, near the base of that cliff down by the river in this region, there are volcanic ash beds. And those volcanic ash beds actually have zircons in them. And the zircons are something like 546 plus or minus 1 million years old. So that gives us a precise datum, if you will, that helps us to calibrate the rock record. And whenever you see a, a, a geologic time scale, it's the result of thousands of geologists over many decades going out, finding volcanic rocks in uh, places that allow us to correlate them with fossils or climatic events. And we build up the time scale from that. If there are no rocks that are 4.5 billion years old on Earth, though we do have some zircons, why, if the rocks that we do have and have found good evidence for life in them, even if the nature of that life is still a bit questionable, why is it reasonable on this basis to conjecture that life originated half a billion years earlier, even though, of course, at those time scales, it's fuzzy. But why Why half a billion years? Yeah, there are some so-called metamorphic rocks, that is, rocks that have been subjected to, uh, originally sedimentary rocks that have been subjected to heat and pressure. And rocks back to at least 3.9 billion years old do show evidence of this carbon isotopic signature that we see elsewhere. 
So it's only one line of evidence. It's nicer to have, have multiple ones, but we basically see nothing in the preserved rock record that, um, you know, is easily associated with an abiological world. So, you know, if you tell me, well, it was really 3.9 billion years ago, fine. I mean, 4 billion years is a number that's brooded about because it's about the biggest or the, you know, the simplest large number that uh, you can associate with this. But yeah, sure, there's there's a fair amount of uncertainty. I think we most models for the evolution of the Earth's surface suggest that there would have been liquid water um well before four billion years and so you know the origin of life could have taken place very early we just don't know one other thing about um the origin of life and life on earth that i think bears thinking about is that when people think about life in the universe they commonly think about you know is it likely or unlikely that life will begin on a given planet or moon and for all we know, it, it may actually be fairly, fairly simple. Um, I, I think it's worth at least considering that what, what is potentially unusual about Earth is not that life began here, but that it's persisted for four billion years. That is not a given for any planetary system. And it, it may, you know, it's certainly what led to technological humans in the long run. Uh, and it may be something that is much less widespread than the origin of life on different planets.